Praise God. Okay. Well, I'd like to, uh, as Di said, welcome you all here today. And I'd also like to welcome our internet audience that uh, are watching online and via our YouTube channel. It's uh, absolutely fantastic. This morning, I want to uh, talk about us as the church. This is something that's been stirring in my heart for, uh, for some time now. And I guess it really all happened during the, uh, during the lockdown, the lockdown period that we've had. And actually, I, I quite enjoyed it. I don't know about you, but I, uh, I quite enjoyed the lockdown. But uh, coming out of the lockdown, uh, I, I feel that you know, I wasn't perhaps quite as engaged as I was beforehand. And I've sort of sensed, and I get the feeling throughout the body of Christ that people have come out and everything's just a little bit cruisy. I mean, we're operating and we're going well, and the Church of Jesus Christ is still alive and well, but we're not really firing on all cylinders. And it concerns me a little bit. You know, when a car is uh, running and it's, uh, one of the cylinders is not, not going, it sputters and it, it moves along, okay, but it's not the power, all the power is not fully there. And so I think it sort of seems to me in a way that, you know, there's a, a general lethargeness. There's, a, um, there's, there's a, like we're half asleep. And um, as I say, I don't want to overwhelm you this morning. I mean, the, our Christian life really is a, a very simple matter. Um, it's foremost about our relationship with God through Jesus Christ and um, to know God and to live with Jesus at the center of our lives. But Today I want to talk about the function of the church. It's, a, it's, it's, it's such a big issue, um, and as I say, I don't want to complicate it, and I want to build quite a foundation today, and I want to talk about the church and how it's not a time to be half asleep. <laughs> it's a time to be fully engaged with the purpose and the things of God. And so uh, I've been stirring about it. I guess God also, first of all, talks to yourself, doesn't he? And then, then you think, well, okay, is this what's going on here in terms of the, the bigger picture? And uh, I believe this is for the church, which is the, the congregation of all believers, really, collectively, the, the church of Jesus Christ. And I believe it's particularly important in these days that we're living in the role of the church. What is God calling his church to do? You know, we're seeing significant things happening in, our, in, in society. The world's just changed. There seems to be a, a real shaking going on, but... We know that the church of Jesus Christ can't be shaken, but there, there is the things are, a lot of happening in the world today. We're in significant times, and it seems to me also most of it is pretty negative. And uh, I don't want to dwell too much on all the things that are wrong, and uh, I want to look at the solutions. But, you know, there's a lot of negative things happening in the world. We're living in significant times. It seems to be a, like a, an even like a clash between the biblical worldview, the, the traditional Christian Judeo culture that, uh, that we build our lives on and, uh, and what's happening in the world today. Uh, we're seeing a redefinition almost of what is right and what is wrong, what is good, what, what is good and what is evil. It's, um, we're seeing like changes in values, things that we used to once think were a, a great virtue now are, are frowned upon it. And uh, we're seeing deception, we're seeing immorality, the whole redefinition of what it means to be a man or a woman and the whole marriage thing. Uh, incredible. We're seeing the issues that are before us right now. We just had the, recently the abortion law. Now we've got this euthanasia. Now the legalization of drugs. I mean, what's going on? And then we also know what's in the wings is the freedom of speech, the religious freedom that we have to worship and speak the word of God. And so um, actually sometimes I've got to pinch myself to think, wow, what is going on here, God? And it seems to have sped up, seems to be sped up. And um, so I'm trying to get my head around this. And uh, I, yeah, I don't want to be like a, a grumpy old man moaning and groaning about everything. Um, but uh, but uh, I do think we need to be concerned. But we need to look at the solution. And God warned us, really. And here's, here's the first scripture for today. It's from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 5 and verse 13. This is the Apostle Paul talking to uh, young Timothy. And he said, Mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, Boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And while evil doers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Wow, that's some list, isn't it? <laughs> it could be quite, quite depressing, really, in a way. It's some list. And, um, you know, I, I guess 
people, the Christians probably have, have interpreted that uh, scripture at any time throughout history. But it seems to me, it did say here at the beginning, there will be, there'll be terrible times in the last days. And we know, and I think most of us agree, most theologians would say that we are living in the last days. We are very close to the return of Jesus. So in some ways, these things shouldn't surprise us. But does that mean that we do nothing? Does that mean we just say, oh, well, that's the way it is? Um, do we, you know, change is happening very, very quickly. And it's almost like, well, and this is why I felt the season. We've sort of come out of this lockdown and it's like, well, what can we do? You know, we just, we just got to go along with the flow. We're helpless. Um, it's just the way it is. As I say, it almost like now. And the Bible says in, 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 in Isaiah 5.20, it said they will call evil good and good evil. And I'm just thinking, man, the change that we've seen, as I say, even just in my lifetime, let alone my, my mother who's still alive, it's lifetime, absolutely incredible. I mean, you think 50, 30 years ago, but say 50 years ago, if, if it was promoted in society that two men could have a child, I mean, it would, be, it would just be ludicrous. People said it's impossible. It cannot not happen. And now it's been promoted. It's been seen as a good thing. How did we come to this? That's, that's, that's calling evil good. And then if we oppose it, we're seen as the radical ones, the intolerant ones, and we're called the evil ones. That's exactly what Isaiah is talking about here. How did we come to this church? But we know that the word of God hasn't changed. So our position cannot change. It's not a matter of being intolerant. We're loving because we want people to come to the knowledge of the truth. So we have to stand up. We have to make a stand, church. And really, this is what I'm going to be talking about the rest of this morning and next week. It's all about the role that the church has to play. It is so important, far more important than most of us realize. Okay, so we can make a huge difference. A huge difference. Remember when Jesus said to the disciples, this is how you pray. He says, our Father in heaven... Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, we can be sure that God's will has not been fully done on earth at the moment. But that's what he wants. And we, as the church, have got a huge role to play. A tremendous responsibility, in fact. You know, our Christian living, praise God, it's a, as I said before, it's a simple thing. We're forgiven, we know we're heaven bound, and the blessing of God is upon us. But really, we're not just here on earth to have a blessed, comfortable, quiet Christian life. God has called us for a far, far higher calling. And uh, it's important that we realize this. So first of all, I want to start out looking at, well, what is the church? Because, I mean, the term church can mean many things to many people, really. It's a church we, can, we refer to as denominations, various denominations. We, we look at the church buildings, or we use the, church, the word church very, very loosely. But what does the Bible say? The, the, the Bible uh, says that the word church comes from the Greek word ecclesia. Everyone say ecclesia. 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 Okay. And that, uh, that, is, that is the term. It's ecclesia. And these, the Bible says that it's all those that have genuinely received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Okay, those who have repented and received their forgiveness of sins and know if they die today, they're going to heaven. Anyone who's done that, as we call a Christian, and is part of the ecclesia. Followers, true followers of Jesus Christ, or we could say true disciples, actually, of Jesus Christ, who make up his church, the ecclesia. And it means, in simple terms, that the, it, is, it is translated... The called out ones. The called out ones. And I want to look at a few scriptures that explain what this means to be called out. What were we called out of? What have we been called into? What's actually happened here? Okay. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. It says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Once we were lost and without hope, Ephesians 2.12, I think it is. Lost and without hope. We didn't necessarily know it, but we were in darkness. But thank God, he revealed his love to us. He showed us and brought us out and provided a solution. 
The Bible says here we are a chosen people. We are a royal priesthood. Listen to these terms. These are significant. We are a holy nation. We are his special possession. This indicates something very, very unique and also indicates something of great value. That's us. We're the church. We're the church. Individuals making up this body called the church. It's fantastic. And he called us. Why are we the chosen people? Why are we the royal priesthood? Why are we the holy nation? Why are we as special possessions? Because he's called us out of darkness and brought us into a new kingdom. Three, three Colossians, oh sorry, one, Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Once we were in the kingdom of darkness without God in our lives. We might not have necessarily known it, but that was the truth. But when we accept Jesus, we came out of his kingdom, the devil's kingdom, and we were accepted into God's kingdom. Once we were under the dominion of the devil's kingdom. Dominion simply means sovereignty over, authority over, control over. So once we were under the authority of the devil's kingdom, but then he redeemed us. Redeemed simply means that he paid the price for us. He paid the price. It, was the, it says here, I'll read it to you. It says, the action of gaining possession of something in exchange for a payment or the clearing of a debt. And of course, that was achieved at the cross when he took all of our sin, everything that we've ever done, all the debt that we owed God for our sin, and he said, put it on me. I'll take it. I'll pay it in full for them. And then anyone who believes in me and trusts in me that I've done this for them can then have my righteousness, my life that I've given. He took the sin, he took the death, that we may have his righteousness and his life. What an exchange. What an exchange he's did, done, done for us. And he's taken us out of that kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light. It's a change of kingdoms from the devil's kingdom into Jesus' kingdom. And now we're part of this supernatural, eternal kingdom but we're also living here in the natural world. And we want to look at this a little bit more. We're physically here, yes, in our bodies. But the Bible says we're new creations. If anyone in Christ is in Christ, he is a new creation. So we are now alive in our spirits. That's the new creation. So we are fundamentally a spirit being. Yes, we have a soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And we live in a physical body. But we are foremostly spirits. We're foremostly spirit beings. And we belong to a different world now. We are the ecclesia called out into a new kingdom. The Bible also refers to us as the body of Christ. The body of Christ. Why does it call us the body of Christ? Because the head and the body are one. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. God placed all things under his feet. He's talking about Jesus. God placed all things under Jesus' feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church which is his body. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Jesus is our head. We are his body. We're joined to him through the acceptance of lordship in our lives. He went to heaven. Okay. And he's sitting there now with the father. But he's left us here. So physically we're separated. One day we're going to be physically together. Isn't that marvelous? What a hope we have. But we're still one spirit with him. We are one spirit with the Lord. And uh, we're joined to him through, our, through his lordship in our lives. Now, he's left us here for a specific reason. He's coming back very soon. We call it the rapture of the church. But in the meantime, he's left us here for a specific reason. And uh, we believe that he's coming back very soon. So we are his called out people. And we need to be aware of the bigger picture that this magnificent group of people called the church has got. We are in a separate spiritual kingdom, but we're here to represent our king. This is the thing. We have a tremendous responsibility. As I said before, it's not just about living a quiet, comfortable life and getting to heaven or about our own personal well-being. Yes, God wants us to have an abundant life, for sure. But there's much, 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 much more, a bigger picture than most realize. Our faith's not just to get that promotion, to get a new car, 
to get a new house, to get ahead in life. Yes, that's important. God wants those things for us. But that's not just what it's about. Our faith has a far higher calling. Our purpose has a far higher calling. Now, I'm building a foundation here, so stay with me. We know that in this church, we have uh, taken on board some time ago the, uh, the five purposes. And we saw quite clearly uh, that really God has five key purposes on earth here for us to do. And we talk about worship, that we're all called to worship God. And we know that's really not optional if you're a Christian. You want to worship God. You want to praise Him. We're called to be discipled. In other words, God wants to change us more and teach us and to become more like Christ. So it's called the discipleship process. So these things are not optional. These are the core things that we do as a church. We're called to fellowship one with another. God wants us as a family, brothers and sisters in Christ, to fellowship together. That's part of what we're doing today. So we have the, we have the purpose of fellowship. We have the purpose of ministry. Where we've all got different gifts, skills, and abilities. And so we're called to serve together in the church, in the body. So the body is complete. Many parts, the word says, but one body. So we're in different parts of the body, and we, when we bring our gift, we bring our time, we bring our talent, and we serve God. That's ministry. And then the fifth purpose, of course, is evangelism. That we're called to reach out and share our faith with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, all these five purposes, and we're all fairly familiar with those, I'm sure, they are all done generally within the, the confines of the, of the church. But today, I, I sort of, when I was looking at this, I think, well, really, there's a sixth purpose. There is a sixth key purpose. And it's more to do, though, with the spirit aspect of things in the spiritual realm. It relates to a spiritual function. And I don't think it's any less important. The five purposes, you know, uh, all have the place. We don't ignore them, particularly the preaching of the gospel. That's why Jesus has left us here. We've got to... See more people born again and saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But we have a spiritual function. And that sixth, spirit, that sixth purpose, if I could label it that, is for the church to rule and reign in the spirit realm. To rule and reign in the spirit realm. And I think this was what's so been stirring in me, that church, we need to wake up. I mean, I was so thrilled the other week when we had our prayer meeting here and we came along. This is because this is where it's done. It's, it's done, done, in, done mainly through prayer and in the spirit realm. So we operate through the spirit, not in, in a natural way. And I'll, I'll come to that further later on. But um, we've got to understand our spiritual function. We're called to rule and reign. We could say that the church, the ecclesia, in fact, are a, a government. We're a spiritual government on earth here. Very important. I mean, you look at natural governments. They come and go. Big, huge corporations, institutions on the world, even nations come and go. But the church of Jesus Christ will never pass away. It'll be here forever. Even the earth will pass away when God recreates things. But the church of Jesus Christ lives on forever. Amazing. Absolutely incredible. It's eternal. So we need to be fully aware of the significance of uh, this reality. We are God's ruling authority on earth. Now, I was actually, when I was preparing for this, you know, you, Google can be good, but it can be very dangerous. <laughs> and uh, I came across a couple of sites and, 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 and things that I was looking at, whereas there are many theologians, uh, hopefully in the minority, that might disagree with this. They will say, no, God's in charge. You, who do you think you are? God's sovereign. He's the one who's in charge. Everything happens because oh, God, God's in charge. You, 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 who, do you, who do you think you are? The church. But uh, I, we don't agree with that. But some would dispute it. So I just really want to establish this for us today. I'm sure most of us know it because we've had a lot of teaching in this house about uh, the authority of the believer. And we've got series and tapes and old messages you can go to if you really want a, a full teaching on that. But I do want to touch on it. I do want to touch on it. Let's have a look once again. And I'm quoting a lot of scriptures today actually from the book of Ephesians. And uh, if you're looking to do some more study during the week, and uh, I'd encourage you to read the book of Ephesians. It is amazing. I mean, all God's words amazing. It's all truth and it's all absolutely necessary. But I just love that, uh, the book of Ephesians. Man, it's got some powerful truths in there. Some wonderful stuff. Anyway, let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter 1. And we're looking at verses 18 to 21. Once again, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. He said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know to the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in, the, in his holy people 
and his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and then seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power, dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. Incredible bit of scripture. He wants our eyes to be open, be aware of what he's done and who we are. That we may know the hope. We've been called to an amazing hope. We've been called out. He's called us. And he's called us into the riches of his glorious inheritance. We are a glorious inheritance for the Lord. We are his holy people. And it says here that his incomparable great power for us who believe. That's us, the church. That's the believers. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead. I don't think there's any greater power, is there? And it's for us, the church. He's saying, hey, church, this is for you. And here's the point. And then, if he raised Jesus from the dead, he seated him at his right hand. That's Father God. Seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above, what does it say here? Rule and authority, power and dominion. Every title that can be given. And it confirms that Jesus, as we all know, is ruling in heaven right now over every spiritual being. That's his position. Now, here's the point. Here's the point. A couple of verses later, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, he says this, And God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So we know where Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Spiritually, that's where we're seated, with, next to Jesus in those heavenly realms. And therefore, we're ruling with him as well. You know, when the Bible refers to seat, seat has reference to a position of authority. Like we talk about a seat of government, don't we? It's, it's a position of rule and power. And like a throne, a king's throne, for instance. Um, we know that that is also a position, an emblem of position of rule and power. It represents the governing authority. So positionally, we are seated in the heavenly realm with Jesus to rule and reign. Our head is in heaven, but we the body here on earth. But we're one with him. As I mentioned before, we're one, one, 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says we are one spirit with the Lord. Now, Jesus can't operate fully without his body. He needs us to do our part. And uh, obviously, we can do nothing. Nothing without him. Uh, you think about, I, when I was preparing, I was getting that picture of a, um, have you ever been on a farm and seen a chicken killed and they chop its head off? And they, so I think sometimes that's what the church can be look like. Not our church. Uh, the church can look like running around like headless chickens, not connected to the head. And that's what we would look like. That's what the church would be like without Jesus if we're not connected with Jesus. And too many churches have, have excluded Jesus from the church. And they're trying to go through religious activity and doing all the things. Well, it, they might as well be running around like that headless chook. Achieves nothing. We've got to be connected to the head. <laughs> okay? And Jesus. And that's why Jesus is the center of everything we do. Amen. Everything we do. It's all about Jesus. It's for Jesus. It's through Jesus. It's by Jesus. It's in the name of Jesus. He's at the center of everything. We move him. We minimize that in any way. We put him even to the side. We're losing our way. As I say, seen those trucks running around? <laughs> It's amazing. How can they still even be moving? So they tell me it's something to do with the nerve system. But anyway, they run around, the blood's going. Oh, I don't know enough detail. But it's funny. <laughs> it's so funny. Okay, poor Chook. We like eating it, though, don't we? <laughs> Praise God. All right. So the church is seated and supposed to be the governing authority on earth. And the God, it's always been God's intent, actually. It's always been God at its intent. You go back to the, the creation account in the book of Genesis. And when he created the world and he created Adam and Eve, uh, he created them to rule and reign over the earth. Let's just look at Genesis 1.27. Talking about Adam and Eve. Then it said, God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on earth. Dominion. Remember, we looked at that before. 
have sovereignty over, have authority over, have control over. This was God's intent. God, he actually gave the earth to mankind. He created it for man to enjoy and to rule over. Psalm 115, 16 says, The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man to enjoy, to rule over. But there was a problem. Let's look at what the New Testament says here in Romans 5.17. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through that one man, Christ Jesus? So God's original plan was for, for man to rule over the world. To have authority over the world. To have dominion over the world. And he gave it to Adam and Eve. But we all know the story. As the scripture says here. If by the trespass of one man. It's talking about the trespass of Adam. Remember when Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said everything's for you. But because he gave free will. They had to be one little thing. And the one thing that they weren't allowed to do. Was to eat. He said you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because the day you do that you will surely die. And anyway, we know the story. The devil came, tricked Eve. Adam whipped out, went along with it, and ate. And sin and death came into the world. And we've been dealing with it ever since. This was a huge problem. And so when we go through nearly 2,000 years of 3,000 years or something of church history, of, of not church history, but of, of history, and um, God brought in the law of Moses and he tried to sort things out. And in the end, which is always part of his master plan, he said, this is no good. I don't want people to live like this. This is not my original intent. I want to restore things to how I originally made them. And so he sent Jesus, of course, and the Bible refers to Jesus as the last Adam. And then he won back everything that Adam had lost and restored it. And all the authority that had been lost to, to, to the devil, who's called the God of this world, and his demonic forces was now taken off him. He defeated him on the cross at Calvary. He rose again, and he won back the authority on the earth. And, of course, then he delegated it. He gave it to his church. He said, well, I'm going now to heaven. He says, oh, I go to be with the Father. He says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore. Matthew 28. And he gave the authority to the church. Now, as I say, we've got a whole series of preaching and messages on that. I don't want to dwell on it. Too much, but the church has authority over Satan's kingdom. Not only are we out of it, but we have authority over it. We must realize this. I'll give you one scripture. Luke 10 19. Jesus said again, I have given you authorities, talking to the disciples, talking about his followers. I have given you authority to trample on the snakes and on the scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy, and nothing will harm you. Snakes, scorpions. Refer to the demonic forces. These are the enemy, the devil and his spiritual kingdom of wickedness. So our positional truth is that we have authority in Jesus' name. It's not authority on our own merit and our own right. It's his delegated authority that he gave his church when he sent that, set us out and gave us the Great Commission. But Satan's still around. The devil's still around. And he's trying to exercise his authority on the earth. And guess what, church? As a spiritual government, it's our job to stop him. And I think the church has abdicated this far too much. And it's time for us to step up. And when I'm saying the church, I could say, well, we're not talking about some, some obscure entity. We're talking about it's made up of individuals. It's all of us collectively. If we all do our part, if we all stand and do our part, the devil cannot stand against us. But if we abdicate the responsibility, don't take it seriously or are uninformed, then he can get away with stuff. And look. They will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I, I, I'm sure there's plenty of things that God's not happy about on earth at the moment. Is that maybe because the church hasn't fully done her job? Okay, so I'll, I'm not... I just want to look ahead. I think, man, I got, you know, I've got to be alert. I've got to be awake. And uh, we've got to be ready to uh, exercise this authority on Jesus' behalf to see God's will be done, to see his kingdom come. We're in a spiritual war between two kingdoms. It's like there's a huge battle going on. We can't see it, so therefore we tend to shut it out of our minds. But behind everything that's going on, there are spiritual dynamics. It's very real. Look what uh, 
Look what uh, it says also in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. It says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. People are not the problem. I mean, there are some people that are pretty annoying and we think they're evil. But really behind it all, there are demonic influences that are causing them to do what they do, say what they do, and behave like they do. It says, your struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. So who are these? Let's have a look at this a little bit more. Who are these rulers, these authorities, these powers of darkness, these spiritual forces of evil, which are also mentioned earlier on when I, I, I quoted Ephesians chapter 1 and elsewhere in the Bible? Well, they're demonic angels, demonic spirits, who are absolutely opposed to the things of God. Absolutely opposed to the things of God and all he stands for. Let's look at it from the same scripture. Let's look at it this time from the New King James Version. That first one I read was from the NIV. Let's look at it now, the same scripture, uh, a little bit more extra verse, from the uh, New King James Version. It says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against the rulers of this present darkness, and against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So here, we, here, here it's, uh, it's being translated as principalities and powers. In the NIV version, it called it rulers and authorities. But either way, these are the demonic forces. These are the army of spiritual wicked beings that rebelled against God and were thrown out of heaven with, with the devil way back. And that's another story. Okay, And they could be compared to a human army. I think they're highly organized, more organized than we think. Um, you think about a human army, um, it, uh, it, it implies different ranks, positions, different tasks, different purposes. But like in an army here, we have the army, we have the air force, we have the navy, marines, whatever. There's different, different aspects to our, our forces, our armed forces. And um, I think when we see these different titles, principalities, powers, rules, authorities, dominions, and so on, we're talking about tiers of authority and level within Satan's kingdom. It's highly organized and highly structured. It's very interesting. Anyway, all of these titles indicate that these spiritual beings, they're all in a negative sense. We know that they are all aligned with the devil. And um, they're outside of this natural realm, but they are still, nevertheless, very, very real. Just as God's angels are. All the good angels, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. They are evil. They're never about good. They're about opposing God's purposes. They hate God and they hate his children. They hate us. <laughs> but we don't need to be afraid of them, all right? We have an authority. We have a responsibility to deal with them. We also have the power to deal with them, all right? 2 Corinthians 10:14 says this The weapons of our warfare, because we are in a battle, are not carnal. In other words, they're not natural, but they are mighty, spiritual. Spiritual weapons, not carnal, not natural, they're spiritual weapons. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, strongholds is another military term. A stronghold means a defensive structure. And we could say that the strongholds we see around it where we have demonic influences in certain areas of society, around even people's lives. They're demonic strongholds. He's got them captive where he wants them. But Jesus came to set the captives free. Amen? And our job is to continue with that battle that Jesus came and showed us the way to do. So, God has empowered us. We are in a battle but I tell you what, we know, we've read the end of the book, as we sang in the song before, we know we have the victory. Amen? We have the victory. He's empowered us because we're in a weapon. And we, but he would not have left us here, I tell you, if uh, we couldn't triumph. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 2.14. It says this, Now thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ Jesus, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. So we're fighting, church, from a position of victory. We're not trying to get the victory. So you've got to be careful how you interpret that song that we sing, actually. 
We're not trying to get the victory. It's already been won at the cross. The devil is totally defeated. We are fighting and seated in the heavenly places above. Above, the Bible says. Above the principalities, powers, authorities, and dominions. We rule and reign in this life by one Christ Jesus. We have the victory, but we are nevertheless still in a war. You know, I realized this early on in my Christian life. This is what's, I, I've experienced it, and some of you may have as well. It comes in different shapes or forms. But some of you might have heard this story before, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it again because it was so impactful. It made me realize the reality of what's happening in the spirit realm around us. Uh, I got saved. I, I saw the light. I came out of the darkness. And that's what it was like. My life was actually pretty good when I, before I got born again. I was going along. I didn't really have a problem. I had no crisis. I was living a good life, good job, good wife, good family, living the dream. Well, I thought so. Um, but when I became born again, uh, and I won't go into the full testimony of my salvation, but it was like the light came on. I thought, ah. All of a sudden, I could just see so much clearly. I realized, ah, oh, this is what life's all about. It was incredible. Literally, you know, talk about coming out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. Well, I can testify. That's exactly what it was like for me. Anyway, get back to the story. I uh, was uh, very early on. It must have been only in the first few weeks of being born again. I didn't really understand much about Christian living and about the Bible or anything, really. Um, and uh, I was sort of a sort of a very stable sort of person. I had a very balanced sort of person. But all of a sudden, I started to get these thoughts in my head. It was like I wasn't even thinking them, but they were there. It was just awful. And it got worse, and it got worse. I thought I was going mad. It was very aggressive, and um, it was like my mind was being bombarded. And it was just ugly stuff. I mean, terrible, terrible, sick stuff. And I thought, where's this coming from? I know I was a pretty bad person, you know, and I, but, you know I, I, but where is all this stuff coming from? And it was really weird. Um, and uh, I didn't have an understand, understanding at all of what was happening to me. I just, I'm beating myself up. I'm saying, well, this is terrible. I mean, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> I became a Christian. And uh, what's going on? And anyway, it just kept getting worse. Anyway, one day I was in bed. And I was trying to hide it. I was trying to ignore it. I was trying to willpower it away. It just wasn't working. And, uh, but it was just too hard. And I was thinking, God, what will God be thinking of me? Because I know he can read my mind. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. He can't. I'm thinking that. What's he thinking of me? I was, it was terrible. But um, one night I was lying in bed and God spoke to me. And he said, it can't hurt you. And I thought, was that me or was that God? It can't hurt you. And it was sort of at that moment I realized, hang on a minute. This, 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 this is something to do with the devil. I'd only barely heard about the devil. I didn't really understand much about it, but this is something to do with the devil. I knew it was demonic, just something within my spirit. must have known. As I said, I didn't, didn't necessarily understand it intellectually. And um, anyway, I said to God, okay, I don't know what to do. I give up. I don't know what to do, God. I don't care anymore now. I'm just going to give it to you. I know you love me. I know that I'm forgiven. I know that you accept me. You care about me. What do I really need to be afraid of? And so um, I said, right, bring it on. I'm not going to try and resist anymore. So I lay in bed. This is unbelievable. It's still so real to me today, even though it was many years ago now. <laughs> and uh, and uh, anyway, uh, what happened was I was lying there. And then if any of you ever had um, ringing in your ears like tinnitus, you know what I mean by that? It's like it's very real, real sound inside your head, although you know that no one outside can hear it. Well, it was like this inside my head. It was a, it was a ringing like that, and it and it and it goes and all I'm lying there, and all of a sudden it starts to increase in pitch. It was building up in its tempo, and I thought, "She was my head's going to explode here. This has got to this has got to come to a crescendo." I said, "There's going to be bits of brain all over the ceiling." I said, and I and it, and, it, and it got and it, and it kept going right up, and I thought till it got couldn't get any higher pitched. And this took about five ten seconds probably only, and I'm just lying there, but I had a piece. It was the weirdest thing. I thought, I don't know what's happening here, but it's too late now. I'm, I'm gone or I'm, I'm good. And so uh, thank goodness I was good. And uh, anyway, it got, and, and then it just, boom, like just went. And all of a sudden, it's like there was this, you know, like when a storm just clears suddenly and there's this eerie peace. Well, that, that's what it was like. And I'm lying there. Whoa, what was that? What was that? And I know that uh, then that was a deliverance. It was a deliverance. Oh, the demons were harassing me, attacking my mind. 
I wasn't thinking the thoughts, so therefore they, they can't be my thoughts. I didn't, you know, they were a demonic attack against my mind. I didn't know it at the time, but that was, uh, I didn't know anything about my authority. Thank God is for the grace of God. Although there was a one scripture that really tells me how that can work. In James 4, 7, it says, submit to God and resist the devil and he'll flee from you. See, I think the problem is that a lot of people try and resist the devil. Not much good if you're not submitting to God. The important part is submitting to God. Submitting to God. You want the devil to leave. But if you're not in submission to Jesus Christ, you're not fully devoted to him. Well, I tell you, the devil's got a right. He's a legal expert. So the key is the submitting to God part. We resist the devil all we like, but we've got to submit to God first. And so that's what I'd done. And that whole thing I said to God, look, I give it to you. Well, that's exactly what he was wanting to hear. And so I got my deliverance. It was amazing, fantastic. And, and as I say, I've now through that, actually, I've learned to recognize a little bit more about what's happening. And I went and did an amazing amount of study on this whole subject. And I'm still learning. But to recognize, you know, my spiritual radar up. What's of the devil? What's of God? What's going on here? And uh, very important to know that, church. And so... Uh, I, uh, I, I must say that since then I've had a few, few challenges and I had one other major one in my life. I've only probably ever had the two. Um, but generally, I think the, the devil has, um, has, uh, has given up on me. Um, you know, I've sort of uh, haven't had much problem with him ever since. So we do have an enemy. We are in a battle. We're not to be afraid. We are on the winning side. Now look what Jesus also said here in Matthew 16, 18. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is building his church, each and every one of us, individually and collectively. Isn't that a wonderful thing? He's at work in our lives. That's why it's so important we cooperate with him so we can be the church that he wants us to be. Don't resist the Holy Spirit when he tells you to do something. Don't resist the word of God when it directs you to do something. Can, or the Holy Spirit, when he convicts you, hey, that's wrong. He's building us. He's building us. He's building his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. Prevail means not to be, they will not be too strong for us. So what does the gates of hell mean? Well, hell, and in some versions you might see the word Hades. Uh, it's just the, uh, the Greek. Um, Hades, which means the invisible, unseen realm of Satan's kingdom. Okay? And gates, of course, represent a place of authority. They're places of authority. Gates are places of authority. The seats of government, we might say. You remember when Pastor was talking uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about um, uh, uh, husbands and wives, and he said how the men used to gather at the gates. The gates, and that was the place of authority where they would lead and rule from. And, um, and then, of course, that was from, uh, he was talking about the woman, actually, and what they'd be doing. That's Proverbs 31. I hope you ladies have all read... I think, I think there's some in the front row, not Sandra or, or Ali, but there's some in the front row might not have read Proverbs 31 properly since then. So. <laughs> Sorry, darling. So we, Satan's trying to occupy the gates, the positions of authority, okay? Over our city, over our nations, even over your family. And he's about bringing death and destruction. That's what he wants to do. He wants to has his influences, which is always bad. Okay? But the gates are supposed to be our positions of authority. We're supposed to occupy the gates. We could translate that verse. He said, I build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. We could say that the authority of Satan's kingdom cannot overcome the authority of the church. Very important we understand this. Jesus referred to building his church. Then he talks about the gates of hell not prevailing, which is a warfare term. There's a battle going on. So we're building and we're battling. And that's when we talk about the church, we should be talking about how to build the church, but also battle the forces of darkness. The two go together. Do I have, this is a question I ask myself, do I have a positive effect on helping to build God's church? It primarily starts here at our local church, at Victory Christian Center, but also the way we live our lives. Am I working with him? I tell you what, when everybody is in their right place, functioning in the gifts, serving, giving, their time, doing what they, that they need to do, I tell you what, the body is going to be strong and we can achieve so much more. And I believe this is a time, a season, where God is wanting to do something in his church. Say, so come on, guys, it's time to get real serious here. I'm not far away and I'm coming back for a glorious, 
and a wonderful bride without spot, without wrinkle. Get on board. Many have interpreted that scripture. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's almost got a connotation of being in defensive mode. Saying, well, you know, we're, just, we're holding back here. We're just trying to hold the devil out. No, it's not like that at all. It's the other way around. We're to break down his gates and release God's purposes on earth. But this certainly indicates a, a, uh, a major conflict. And as I say, it's not just about protecting ourselves, although that's part of it. It's about a full assault on the demonic realm, on the demonic kingdom. We need to be engaged. No conscientious objectors in God's army, okay? We're all called to be no conscientious objectors, okay? No passive observers. I mean, I, the United Nations cracked me up. They have these um, United Nations observers and, and peacekeeping forces that go into these conflict areas. They do nothing. Look what happened in Rwanda. The United Nations were there. One million people slaughtered. And they said, oh, don't do that. That's not very nice. But it's not how we are with the devil. We've got to be aggressive. We've got to be bold. And in, uh, in the old Yugoslav states, you remember there, particularly Kosovo. And that was only in, that was 1990 or something. Thousands got atrocities. And the United Nations were there. Once again, giving them a slap over the wrist with a wet bus ticket. Achieving nothing. We can't be like that. We're called to engage, church. We're an army, and we're called to fight, to be engaged in the things. We're not to be on the, just on the defensive either. It's not just about stopping the devil. Oh, don't, you know, it's about, it's about actually attacking him. It's not about, oh, wondering where he's going to strike next, or what he's going to do, or just standing back. And it's not even about, and I've, this is what I've seen. I was like this myself. That's why I've given myself a big slap, complaining and thinking, oh, what's going on here? This is all bad. Da, 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 da. It's not, not about that. How about complaining about how bad things are? I tell you what, church, this is our finest hour, and we need to be engaged. The only way we can lose is if we do nothing. But if we engaged with Jesus Christ, he's promised he's building his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. I love, I love the message version. I don't often return, uh, look at this version, but in, in the Matthew chapter 16, uh, verse 18, uh, this is the message version. The same, 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 same one. I'm building my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Message version says this. I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. I like that better. That, 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 that really has got a reference that, hey, we're, we're on the upper hand here. We're attacking him. We're not running away from him. He's running away from us. Okay. I will put my, together my church, a church so expansive with energy. That's why we need some more energy. I came out of lockdown. I didn't have too much energy, I tell you. But I'm getting fired up now. And uh, we've got to stir ourselves up, the Bible says, in our most holy faith. So come on, church. Let's get stirred up now. And uh, the gates of hell will not be able to keep us out. We pull down these strongholds that are affecting our nation. We make a difference. We make a difference. God has given us great power and the authority and the promises to do it. Let's look at the, the whole scripture now in a little bit more detail. This is from verse 15 to 19 of Matthew 16. Now he was talking, they were asking him, who are you, Jesus? Who was the, they were debating who this Jesus was. And, um, and Jesus turned to the apostle Peter. He not know the story. And he said to him, Peter, he said, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not to reveal to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So he will build his church. Not individuals, the church all together is what overcomes the gates of of hell unity and commitment they're two things I thought of man are they so important at this time that we can be one we all know what we're doing we're all on the same side we've got each other's backs we're speaking well of each other and we're not fighting each other let's focus where our real enemy is that's what it's all about church unity is so important and not just here I mean we've got amazing unity in this house but with our brothers and sisters in other churches it's not about comparing competing it's about, hey, he went, God looks at the church. He doesn't look at this denomination and that one there. So, oh, these are the good guys. These are the bad guys. He just knows who's are his. Children out of all denominations. 
He just he knows which ones are his. And I'd be fair to say in most congregations, you know, people are genuinely born again, have been genuinely saved. But there might be some who are not. But that's not our business. That's God's business. He just looks at his body. One beautiful people, the ecclesia. The ecclesia. And here, Peter said, um, you are the Christ. This was a revelation moment that Peter had. He says, and Jesus said to him, you got it, man. You got it. You know who I am. You recognize me. And that's really what, when we get born again, that's what's happened. We're recognizing who Jesus is. We've got a revelation that he is the son of God, the living God. And uh, he said, through that revelation, I give you the keys to the kingdom so you can bind and loose. We have to have the revelation of Jesus Christ. We have to know that we know that we're born again, that he is seated in authority so that we can use the keys. If we don't know that, we can never use the keys. We're wasting our time. We have to, it's all built to know who we are in Christ. Know that he's alive and we're alive in him. And we're seated with him with the authority to represent him. And like Peter, like the disciples, they also have to be under his authority. Walking in our authority comes from being under the authority of Jesus, not just doing our own thing. Just like he was with the Father. Remember it says in John 5.19, he says, very, very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father's do, Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. And it's the same with us. Jesus is our role model. He's, we're submitted to him and his lordship in our life. And then he gives us the keys to the kingdom. So we can use them to come against the forces of darkness. Use them effectively. He said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Keys also represent authority. You think about it. You've got a key to the car. Well, you've got the authority to drive the car. You've got the key to the house. You've got the authority to go into the house. Keys represent authority. He says, I've given you the authority. Basically, he's saying the authority of heaven. The keys to the kingdom of heaven. I've given you the authority of heaven to go out, bind and loose. In other words, to stop or let happen. To permit or not permit. To forbid or allow. So, we know our authority. We know we have the victory. He's given us the keys. But he's also given us a lot more than that. We have the Holy Spirit in our spirit, really, and that's what gets the job done. Look what 1, 1, 1 John 4, 4 says. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome the world. Sorry, and overcome them talking about demonic forces. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you, that's the Holy Spirit, is greater than the one who is in the world. Amen. And that's talking about the devil, the God of this world. So greater is he, greater is he that is in us than he is in the world. So we are, we've got one far greater in us. In our own strength, we can't do much. But through the Holy Spirit within us, we can do so much more. Luke 17, 21 says, The kingdom of God is within us. But why? Because the king lives within us. We can't achieve anything in our natural strength and ability. Walking in our authority is not just a formula, church. It's not just a formula. There is real power in each and every one of us. It's Holy Spirit power. I love the story, and we'll begin to close. Um, I wanted to want to share the story. I quite, I quite enjoy it. Um, and it's uh, you might recall in the book of Acts, there's a story about... Uh, a group of guys that they refer, refer to as the seven sons of Sceva. And so let's read the story now from, um, uh, this is how not to do it. <laughs> the seven, seven sons of Sceva in Acts chapter 19, verses 13 to 16. Now some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Now seven sons of Sceva, who was a Jewish priest, were doing this. And one day an evil spirit answered them. And the evil spirit said to them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? <laughs> and the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, 
and overpowered them all and gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. <laughs> Sorry, it just makes me laugh. I have this picture of these guys running down the street bleeding naked. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, here's the point. Here's the point. <laughs> these guys, these turkeys, were trying to use a formula. Okay? They'd seen Paul do it. And they thought, oh, well, this is pretty good. Let's get it on the act here. Now, here's the thing. They didn't know Jesus. It's in him, remember? Knowing who we are in Christ is the absolute key, being under his authority. They didn't know Jesus. They were never truly under his authority, and they certainly didn't have the Holy Spirit. And that's what happened. Not good. But the good news is we have. We have the authority of Jesus. We have um, the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we can't lose. Jesus already defeated the enemy. And we apply it. How do we apply it? It's mainly through what we say. It's through the word of God. The Bible talks about the word of God being the sword of the spirit. It's our main attacking weapon. It's God's word. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, it said. It demolishes strongholds. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Word of God. Very, very powerful. And we know that all of God's promises, all of God's word is true. And they're all promises for us. And they are all yes and amen in Jesus. Hallelujah. So we have the word of God that we use. We have the authority. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. What a deal. What a deal. Talk about a stacked deck. We can't go wrong. And then not only that. Not only that, but there's more. It's like one of those ads, isn't it? You know, <laughs> wait, there's more. We've got, we've got uh, wonderful. We've talked about demonic forces and spiritual angels, dealing with demonic angels, but we've got a wonderful host of God's angels, servants of the Most High God, servants of Jesus that are waiting for us. Incredible as that sounds. Once again, can't see it, but it's true. Look what uh, Hebrews 1.14 says. It said, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation? Well, who inherits salvation? We do because we've believed and trusted in Jesus Christ. We're the ones who inherit salvation. And they are ministering spirits sent to serve us. Wow. Wow, that's huge. So angels are looking for an opportunity to work on our behalf in line with God's purposes. They're waiting. They're waiting to be commissioned. They're waiting for the decree from our mouth to go forth, to send them into action. We looked at this. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. The main best example I think we can see in the Bible is uh, of, of an angel being activated by the decree of the saints is, uh, in the book of Daniel, where uh, you know we know the story that Daniel was, had realized that the, the Jews had been in captivity and for Babylon for, for 70 years. And he'd read that the God had said, well, that's the time frame. So he gets in prayer before the Lord to say, hey, God, he stood in the gap for his people. And he said, right, Lord, what are we going to do about this? And, uh, and I won't go into the full story. But here's the point. God, as he prayed that, an angel was sent. The archangel Gabriel, as it happened, was sent down to come to Daniel, to tell him the plan, to tell him what's going on. To bring the strategy. We read in Daniel, Daniel 9.23. And Gabriel came to him and he said, As soon as you prayed, an answer was given. And I, which was given, which I have come to tell you. So it was Daniel's prayer. Daniel's declaration that invoked the angel to come. So angel, God's angels' armies are waiting for our commission. For our decrees. And they're here to support us in all that we're doing in this battle that we have against these spiritual forces of darkness. So, how much time have we got? <laughs> We've got a lot to cover. Next week. Okay, I'll just uh, I'll carry on on what I've got here, just for for a few minutes more. So I want to talk, you know, a lot more next week about, I guess, how we apply this. 
and really what we what we what we can do. I mean, I've talked about where we sit and all that's got to happen. Well, okay, what do we do? What do we do now? So, but we'll talk about that more next week. But uh, just one other point I wanted to to raise that you know this position that we are as the Church of Jesus Christ. Um, eh, yes, it is to govern in the spirit realm and, and to deal with the demonic forces so that God's will can be done on earth. But there's, there's another. Uh, it's an interesting scripture here, and I'd never really seen this. You know, I must have read the book of Ephesians dozens of times, but I just never really twigged this particular scripture to me. And, uh, and, um, but it does refer to, I guess, the purpose of the church also. And this is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. <clears throat> Once again, this is Paul speaking, letter to the Ephesians. He says, his intent was now, through the church, was now that... Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers, the authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church is to demonstrate, to make known to the spiritual realm the wisdom of God. Well, what does that mean? It says the manifold wisdom of God. Well, manifold just simply means many aspects of God. So the church is here to, to make known to these spiritual forces God's wisdom. And how does that happen? Well, when we demonstrate the finished, his finished work in redeeming us from sin, from restoring us, when we triumph, when we win, we have to be God's living testimony that Jesus has fully overcome and we have a victory through him over the works of Satan. And that we rule and reign. We're to demonstrate this. God's looking for us to demonstrate this. When we demonstrate the victory that Jesus has. And walking in all that he has purchased for us. That's what brings God glory. We're to help fulfill God's purposes on earth. It's primarily in the area of winning souls. Um, and getting people transferred from the devil's kingdom into God's kingdom. Um, and we're to take dominion over these spiritual forces of wickedness and to demonstrate God's power and purposes. That's what it means to reveal the manifold wisdom of God. We're showing something to these spirit girls. Hey, guys, we've got it. We know who we are. We bring glory to God. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God may be known to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. The church, and one of the missions of the church is to display before the hosts of heaven the wisdom of God. It's a tremendous incentive for us to be all that Christ made us to be, I tell you. It's pretty hard, really, and, and, to understand in many ways, but we need to be viewing our Christian life from this Chris, uh, spiritual perspective. The church is to demonstrate to all the evil powers of the universe that God has been wise and victorious in sending his Son, and that we are unified as a body, and we know who we are. And then we're in him and he's in us. Our lives and our actions in some ways, you might think, well, what has this got to do with me? But Lord, everything you do, the way you live your life is so important. Because collectively we make up the body. We make up the church. One part is not working so well. The rest of it's not fully complete, is it? So we all need to be doing our part, our life and our actions. We need to be uh, realize just what's at stake here. We ought to be a showcase, if you like. Of God's wisdom and glory. Jesus says, it calls us in, in Matthew 14, he says, we are the light of the world. Well, we could say in a way that we are not only the light of the world, but we're the light to all creation, to the spirit realm as well. You are the light of the world, Matthew 14, uh, sorry, Matthew 5, 14 and 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We're the light of the world when we reveal the nature and the character of Jesus in our lives. When we walk in love to all people, we have a right attitude towards others. When we exalt and honor the name of Jesus, when we proclaim him, when we preach the gospel, when we really do trust in him, when we do really obey, not picking and choosing, fully submitted to obeying him. We're the light of the world when we walk in faith, 
Not trusting in our own abilities, but acknowledging our need of God. Fully trusting in Him. We're the light of the world when we stand up for righteousness. And praise God for Pastor Stephan. You know who in recent weeks, he's been saying what a lot of pastors wouldn't say from their pulpits. Addressing some of these evils in the world today. He's making a stand for righteousness. He is a light in the world. Pray for our pastor. Pray for our pastor. He's a, he's a good man and he's making a stand. I admire him for it. And it's not just here in the pulpit, in the safety of the church. He, what he's in here, he's, he's out there also. So we make a stand for righteousness. And we live in harmony. We live in unity. These things, the light of the world that Jesus is referring to. When we serve, when we honor each other above ourselves. And I have to ask myself, am I living like this? Am I really living like this? Am I doing these things? Am I walking in love towards all people? Am I preaching the gospel? Sharing my faith? Am I really walking in faith? Am I obeying and trusting in God completely? Am I making that stand for righteousness like I should? Or do I sit on the fence and don't talk about that? Being politically correct? Am I living in harmony and unity? Am I honoring my brothers and sisters and others? Coming back to our original verse, and we'll finish with this. 1 Peter 2.9 We are a chosen people. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are God's special possession. Church, we've got to get this. This is a tremendous thing that we've been called to. Out of darkness, into this light. We've got a massive role to play in how we live our lives. Next week, I'm going to be looking at what we can do in terms of um, stopping the demonic influence in the world. And releasing God's influence in the world. You know that, that, that verse it says there. <clears throat> we looked at most of it earlier on. But the one part we didn't look at was. It said you're a chosen people. Royal priest, a priesthood. A holy nation. God's special position. That you may declare the praises of him. Now that doesn't mean worship. Although of course obviously. We should worship him. We should praise him. Absolutely. But it said declaring the praises of him. What that really is be, be better interpreted. Is to show forth the virtue of God. To demonstrate his character, his qualities. That's what we're called to do as a church. We're his representatives. We're his body here on earth. We should reflect the glory of God in our lives to show forth the virtue of him. The reason God created the church was to show himself to the world. He's proud of us, guys. He's proud of each and every one of you. He loves us so much. And he wants to show himself to the world through us. He wants to boast about us. So when that devil comes before him and accuses the brethren, he says, oh, look at my church. Look at my church. Look at the beautiful bride, the people I've called out who love me, are serving me with all their heart. That's us, guys. We want God to be proud of us. And when we get to there, when we arrive at that day, he's going to say, welcome. Come into my kingdom, you good and faithful servant. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but that's what I want. Praise you. Bless the Lord. We're going to continue uh, next week. As I say, we've got, uh, I'm not even halfway, so <laughs> I don't know how we're going to go, but uh, thank you for staying with me. We're building a foundation this week. It's just a very much a foundation. Next week, we're going to get, in, get, get, going to get into some stuff that we can do, we need to do. Uh, it's not hard, but we need to be focused. We need to be deliberate. Thanks for watching Victory Christian Center. For more content, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Or you can subscribe to our podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, or Google Podcasts. Check out our website at victory.net.nz. We'll see you again soon.